I want to welcome you this morning to Redemption Hill Church. If you're visiting, my name is J.D. Summers. I serve as pastor here, along with Pastor Stephen. Uh, and this morning, we get the privilege of hearing from a guest preacher, a friend of mine, someone that I look up to and respect. His name is Brett Kapranica. He will be opening God's word to us this morning. Brett is the pastor at Summit Woods Baptist Church in Lee Summit. Um, but that's not the only place he's pastored. Uh, Brett's been in ministry for longer than you think. Uh, he started preaching when he was 18 and pastored. Uh, it was in ministry down in Texas at two different churches in California, uh, especially while he was going through seminary there. And then in 2010, he and his family moved to Lee Summit. They've been serving there ever since. And many of you men in our church have heard Brett preach before. If you've been to the Iron Men Summit in Emporia, we go once a year with our men down there. And uh, so you know already that Brett is a careful student of God's word, that he is a faithful preacher, an expositor. Um, and so we are excited to hear from him this morning. But we've asked Brett to come because he's actually more than a good preacher. Brett's been a very faithful shepherd. Uh, the church there in Lee Summit has thrived under his leadership, and Brett's ministry, his shepherding ministry, has actually overflowed the, the boundaries of his church, and he's had an impact in the, the Kansas-Missouri region. He's not only involved uh, in a meaningful sense in his denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention, but Brett's been instrumental in, in really building and cultivating a fellowship of like-minded churches, uh, a group of men, pastors. Uh, I'm included in that. We get together, and, and we talk. We have lunch. And there's a, for me, there's been so much benefit and help in that. So I'm very thankful to call uh, Brett a friend, although I'm afraid it's one of those friendships where the benefit flows mostly one direction. And I'm not ashamed to be a taker. So I'm thankful to invite Brett. And we welcome his family, Kelly and Bree and Emmy and David. Good to have you guys here. I know it's mandatory fun for you kids. You had to come with your dad. But we're thankful to have you here. And we want to welcome you. And Brett, ask you if you would come and open God's word to us this morning. Thank you, J.D. Am I on here? Is this all working? Okay, great. Um, I just need a minute to look and see you for a minute. We have prayed at Summit Woods for this church for many years since it began. What, 10 years ago? Some 10 years ago? Um, and I can't wait to go back to Summit Woods and tell them of our experience here. We have been so thankful to see what God has done and to hear of all that God is doing at Redemption Hill. Um, many of you, some of you, I've, I've met through the Iron Men uh, event, and uh, a few of you cooked lunch for our pastor's fellowship that met here several times. And uh, so we're really just thrilled that we get to be a part of this fellowship together and uh, to see what the Lord is doing and to hear what the Lord is doing here is a thrill to our soul. And I can assure you, it's not a one-way benefit uh, in terms of the friendship. Um, I, I would not say this just because it's what you're supposed to do when you're a guest preacher, uh, but I, your pastor, I, I don't know if you really understand what a gift you have in his faithfulness to God's word, his faithfulness and love for you as a congregation, his loyalty to the scriptures, uh, his commitment to build up others in the faith is unique. And it is a real treasure and a blessing. Do not take for granted what you have in not just JD, but in Stephen as well. And the other men that the Lord is raising up who will be leaders here in the future, the Lord is doing a great work here we're thrilled to be, to be able to be a part of this today. So I, I was ecstatic when J.D., not charismatically ecstatic, but just uh, ecstatic, you know, when J.D., I'm still working on that part. You can pray for me in that, but uh, I, I really was thrilled when he asked if we would come and be a part of this Lord's Day with you, uh, just to be able to see the, the good work of God. So I want you to, to turn in your Bible this morning to Revelation chapter 2. I did notice that J.D. preached on this about two years ago, but I know you're, you're a normal congregation. You forgot that already. And, uh, but I think you will also, I'm, I'm confident you did not forget all of what you were instructed in in that wonderful passage 
to the church we're going to look at in Pergamum, beginning in verse 12. <clears throat> but I think you'll see that, uh, that there are a number of ways in which you can, you can preach the Bible, see the same message, the same interpretation of the Scripture will have a variety of implications on a given Sunday for any congregation, and I hope that that is true for us today as we meditate on God's Word again in Revelation chapter 2. Look at verse 12 as I read this, and we prepare ourselves to think through it together. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. Or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes... To him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone which no one knows but he who receives it. Father, we ask for your wisdom and insight as we now meditate on the truth that you have given to us, and we pray that this is effective by the work of the Spirit in our hearts today for your glory for the furtherance of the gospel in this community, for the edification of the saints in this congregation. Honor your name. Bring glory to your Son. Draw our hearts in greater affection and loyalty to Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. So what I want us to think through today is a message that the Lord speaks to a historical church, to be sure, a true historical church in the first century, the church in Pergamum. But I want us to see the lingering message that is here about cultural compromise. Pergamum, we could say, is the church of cultural compromise. Now, compromise can be, it's not always sinister. It can be, but it's not always sinister. To make some progress in the political world, you're probably going to make some compromise. Compromise will be a part of your marriage, I can assure you. It'll be a part of close friendships. In church life, we have doctrines that define orthodoxy, and we have doctrines that define who we are as a congregation. And there will be some doctrines that you differ on within the same congregation. There's a level of compromise there that's not sinister. It's not evil. It's not always a dirty word, but it can be. It certainly can be. And while some compromise can be constructive, we also know that compromise can be eventually corrupting. From its beginning, the church of Jesus has been faced with the threat of a kind of compromise with the surrounding unbelieving culture that threatens its vibrancy, if not its very existence. And we've seen that throughout church history. The church has always been threatened with compromise with the culture. The quest for cultural affirmation and tolerance can move from compromising convenience to redefining our faith altogether. And cultural compromise is what is threatening the church in Pergamum. You know the structure of the seven churches. It's not too difficult to see. The first church and the seventh church are related to one another in their internal struggles. The second church and the sixth church are related to one another in that they are the churches Jesus commends uniquely and has no word of condemnation for. The third, the fourth, and the fifth churches, right in the middle of these messages, 
are an ever-increasing degree of compromise that begins with Pergamum and then culminates with the fifth church, which is the church of the greatest degree of compromise, and they find themselves spiritually dead. This is the first church that describes the slide of compromise towards spiritual death. And it's something for us to give careful consideration to because every day of our congregational existence is going to be one that is challenged with the idea of compromise. Ephesus was the loveless church. Smyrna was the suffering church. Pergamum is the church of cultural compromise. Now, this ancient church in Pergamum that's addressed here is a church that's tripping over the pitfall of compromise, and Jesus confronts them directly. So the question that we want to ask and answer this morning is, how does a Christian congregation, how does Redemption Hill Church, how does Summit Woods Baptist Church, how does any local congregation that names the name of Christ, how do we avoid the pitfall as a church, not just as individual Christians, This is written to a congregation, yes, filled with individuals who love Christ, but a congregation and their congregational identity. How do we as a congregation avoid the pitfall of cultural compromise that could have really eternally damning consequences? How do we avoid it? Well, these verses are going to help us think through it, and I'm going to give you a series of principles don't fear. There are six. We'll be here maybe till two or three this afternoon. But I hear that you're used to that anyway. So, no. I want you to think through these six principles that help us avoid the pitfall of cultural com- compromise as a church. As a church. Yes, these must be true of you individually, but this must be the ethos of who we are as a church. The first. If you want to avoid the pitfall of cultural compromise, keep the ultimate judge in mind. This is critical. Keep the ultimate judge in mind. Look again at verse 12. How does the Lord begin? And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this. To this angel, to the church in Pergamum, I'll just tip my hand here. I think the angel that is described here is actually a heavenly angel. That's my basic interpretation of this. It's an angel who delivers a message. Angels were used by God throughout the scripture to deliver the message of God, the revelation of God to human beings. And here is an angel, we don't know all of the means of which he does it, but once again, here is an angel bringing God's specific direct revelation by John's pen, but to a actual church, a historical church in Pergamum. And Pergamum's a fascinating city. It's the modern city of Bergama, and I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to be there, but it is an absolutely fascinating place to visit. Our family was there just about five years ago touring five years ago about this time, I think it was, um, and touring through places, all the seven churches, and particularly Pergamum or Bergama was an absolutely fascinating place. Now, in the first century, it was a city that boasted a population of around 120, maybe 200,000 are some of the estimates. And for an ancient church, that is absolutely massive for an ancient city. It was the first city in Asia to have a temple that was devoted to the worship of the Roman emperor back in 29 BC in honor of Augustus and the goddess of Roma. This city dedicated a temple to the Caesar. It was one of the foremost cities advocating the cult of the Caesar. As one New Testament scholar, one of my Greek professors from seminary, Robert Thomas, said, a second temple for emperor worship was added during the reign of Trajan, earning for the city the title Neokoros, that is, temple. It preceded both Ephesus and Smyrna with this distinctive, which marked the city's greatest privilege of rendering even the most menial service to the god who had taken up residence there. Compared to all the surrounding cities, Caesar worship was the most intense here. In other cities, 
A Christian might be in danger on only one day a year when a pinch of incense had to be burned in worship to the emperor. In Pergamum, however, Christians were in danger every day of the year for the same reason. Think through that. Every day of your life in this central city of the region where emperor worship is enshrined, a Christian had to choose, am I going to say publicly, Caesar is Lord, when that believer in his heart knows that only Jesus is Lord? And not to say that Caesar is Lord is to put your life on the line. Can you imagine that every day? In addition, in this city, There was developed a well-known library whose collection rivaled that of the renowned library in Alexandria. At its start, the library depended on papyrus material that was imported from Egypt. And the only place that the papyrus plant was grown in large quantities was in Egypt. But Ptolemy uh, Epiphanes of Egypt learned of the project in Pergamum that they were trying to build a library that would rival that of Alexandria. And when he heard of that, he stopped giving them and selling them papyrus. And so Eumenes of Pergamum developed a new writing material manufactured from animal skins called parchment. And parchment comes from the name related to this city. And several kings continued the library project, and the library grew eventually to over 200,000 volumes, which again in the ancient world is just absolutely astounding, only to be later transported by Cleopatra to Alexandria, the rival library point. This city of Pergamum is about 105 miles north of Ephesus. If you can pinpoint that in your mind, Ephesus was the central city in the region. It's about 105 miles to the north and inland about 15 miles. No one knows when Christianity was established in the city, but it was likely during the time of Paul's third missionary journey when he had established the gospel in Ephesus and it began to spread throughout the area. And not only was Pergamum a center point For the worship of Caesar, it also had some of the most prominent temples in all of Asia Minor. The great altar of Zeus the Savior was found here. Remnants of the foundation can still be seen today in a reconstruction of it that is visible in and seen in the Pergamum Museum in Brazil, or pardon me, in Berlin, which contains some sections from the frieze that surrounded it, depicting the mythological battles between the giants and the gods. It's an altar where the sacrifices burning on it were burning 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It was massive. It would not fit inside this room. 116 feet wide, 109 feet deep, the front stairs being more than 65 feet wide. It was absolutely massive, just an amazing sight to see. And in addition to the altar to Zeus the Savior were the significant temples dedicated to Athena and the impressive towering temple to Caesar Trajan. Its amphitheater theater, impressively cascades down a mountain slope just under the temples of Trajan and Athena, and you can walk those steps even to this day. One mile to the west of the Acropolis where all of these temples sat was the massive temple area dedicated to Asclepius, a god of healing, often represented by serpents, to which the infirm would go to find healing of every sort of malady. And various similar temples to other gods were littered across the city. What you have to understand about the ancient world is that every aspect of your life had some connection to some deity. You lived every moment of your life as if you were trying to appease and please some other God around you. And the church in this city was largely faithful, but they were beginning to struggle with a segment of their members who were trying to merge Christianity with some of the tenets of Roman society. It just was easier to live in the society if you could hold on to a little bit of Christianity and do what you could to merge them together with the pagan ideals, you could get by in culture much easier. 
And that's why Jesus has to address this church the way he does. The one who has the sharp, two-edged sword says this. Once again, Jesus is referring to himself here in the opening address of this letter by one of the images that John saw in chapter 1 when he first sees the Lord. Chapter 1, verse 16, records the original image that John saw. Out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And for this church, this image begins with, this letter begins with the image of Christ having the sharp two-edged sword, and it will end at the conclusion of this letter with him describing the sharp two-edged sword coming from his mouth, meaning as book ends, this is the image this church needs to keep in mind. What does it mean? What is it referring to, to describe Jesus, to see him here with the sharp two-edged sword coming from his mouth? Well, we'll see it later in the book of Revelation in chapter 19 when Jesus actually returns to the earth to set up his kingdom on the earth. You see him coming with this sharp two-edged sword. Revelation 19, 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations. What does he do with the sword that comes from his mouth? He strikes down the nations and he'll rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. In verse 21 of chapter 19, and the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. What does Jesus do with the sharp two-edged sword? He comes to judge. You you don't merely think of Jesus and the sharp two-edged sword as being a reference to God's word, which it is. He is the word of God who speaks the word of God. The word of God reveals Christ to us. That is true. The Word of God is pictured as a sharp sword in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, to be sure. But to do what? In this image, in this book, for this church, Jesus and the image of him with a sharp two-edged sword is to remind them that he's coming. He's coming to the earth and he's going to judge the nations who do not believe his word. And he will judge them with the word that comes from his mouth that strikes them and judges them with eternal judgment. For Pergamum, that's very significant. For you and me, that's very significant. Why does compromise come when it does? Likely because of fear. Because of fear. The fear of losing influence, the fear of suffering, the fear of some kind of loss perhaps of your rights or your property, The fear of losing your freedom, maybe even the fear of losing your life. Fear drives compromise. And when you fear losing your freedom, you begin to hold loosely to anything that gets in the way of keeping what you fear to lose. So you then accept what you think will help you keep what you most fear losing. What are you, what do you love so much that you fear losing that you're willing to sin to keep? Maybe what you try to do is you try to find a middle ground, a way to compromise. Let's see if we can make both these convictions work together so we don't have to suffer, so we don't have to lose. In Pergamum, the Roman capital of the province, the proconsul who lived there had what was called the power of the sword. That is, he had the right to render judgment and even carry out capital punishment. Pergamum was a center for the worship of the Caesar and the gods of Rome, the center point of judgment over all society. They possessed the power of the sword. So, to maintain fundamental rights and freedoms, it's likely that some of the believers in the church in Pergamum were beginning to syncretize. What does that mean? It means to meld together an approach to Christianity that made them still feel Christian while also finding some kind of affirmation by the culture that did not threaten them. And Rome would accommodate that. Rome was very open to accommodating some forms of other religious worship as long as Caesar was viewed as Lord. 
and in the midst of a culture with leaders who will not tolerate anything less than full-throated affirmation of them, the only way to avoid syncretism with what the society and its leaders demand is to remember one thing. Who's the ultimate judge? Who's the ultimate judge? Is it going to be Caesar? Is it going to be the pro in Pergamum? Or is it going to be the one who has the sharp two-edged sword? Whose sword do you fear the most? The only thing that keeps a Christian from compromise, the only thing that's going to keep you and me from compromise, even in the culture in which we live right now, is a greater vision of our Lord than is the fear we have of losing some image in the culture that we prize. Who do you fear? Who are you loyal to most? The one who has the sharp two-edged sword. See, this is the first principle to keep you as a church and our church from cultural compromises Do we actually see the Lord coming in judgment? And those who do not remain loyal to him will face the judgment of his word when he comes to judge the nations. The eternal judge is not going to tolerate compromise with the culture. And if you want to avoid the compromise that brings his ultimate and eternal judgment, you keep this vision of him in mind. Every time compromise comes to your mind, think on Christ who's coming. That's the first principle. Let's look at a second. A second principle in avoiding the pitfall of cultural compromise for a Christian congregation is found in verse 13, and that is remember the faithful among the faithless. Remember the faithful among the faithless. Look at verse 13. I know where you dwell where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. The eternal judge with the eternal standard of his word is not unaware of the stakes or the pressure involved. He is fully aware of what we are going through. Our Lord is cognizant of those who remain faithful to him in the midst of a faithless culture and a crumbling confidence among some in the church. He knows. That's heartening to me. After he paints the picture of, I'm the one coming in judgment, I also want you to know, I know. I know what you face. I know where you dwell. I know what the surrounding culture is like around you. I know the pressures they're putting on you to give way. It's where Satan's throne is. Now, it's difficult to know exactly what is meant by Satan's throne here. We don't have to be too precise because of what we know about this city. It was the capital of the region. It was the regional throne. And since it was the original warden of the temple to the worship of Caesar, it was a place of central satanic opposition to Christ. Since it housed that great altar to Zeus, the Savior, which was built in a throne-like form, Pergamum was a dominant place to be seen as the central place where Satan would rule over the entire region. And Jesus is fully aware of the depth and the intensity of the opposition to his word and his worship because of what dominates the cultural scene. But I want you to notice what else Jesus knows, not merely how intense and difficult it is to be faithful. What else does he know? I know you hold fast my name. I know you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith. You hold it fast. It's a word already been developed in these letters to the churches. It's to hold on to something tightly with all of your might. It's holding on to Christ and faith in Christ like a parent would a child who's trying to dart into the street in front of an oncoming car. You're going to hold on with everything in you. There's some in this church who never wavered. They never wavered in aligning themselves as singular worshipers of Jesus Christ without any compromise, without any syncretism with Caesar. Jesus alone was Lord in their hearts. They confessed their identity with that name of Christ, his name, 
They saw salvation and success and satisfaction only in connection with wearing publicly the name of Jesus Christ in a culture like Pergamum. They did not deny, as Jesus says here, my faith. That is, they had absolute confidence in Christ. They waved his flag and not that of the cultural leaders who demanded their loyalty. Faith that Jesus alone is the only acceptable way to forgiveness by the Father. That Jesus alone is the one who is their source of true, lasting satisfaction. Not commingling their loyalties with the culture. They trusted that Jesus, without trusting anyone else to rescue them from the dangers of the culture, Christ would rescue them. In fact, the church in Pergamum had a biographical example that they could easily remember when they need to, needed to think about the practicalities of what singular worship and devotion without compromise looked like. Again, in verse 13, you see it. Even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Now, we really have no specific knowledge as to who Antipas was. We don't know. They knew him. Just to mention his name was to say this church knew who this man was, and they knew him well. They knew his allegiance to Jesus was so clear and so unmixed with the culture that he stood out. He was Jesus' witness. That is, he likely publicly testified to his singular loyalty to Jesus. He was radically faithful. He opposed the worship of health at the altar of Asclepius. He refused to burn sacrifices at the altar that proclaimed Zeus as the Savior. He likely would not say Caesar is Lord or burn any incense at the towering temples of Trajan and Athena. He opposed what the political capital city demanded that he affirm in order to maintain his freedom as a worshiper of Christ. And he was killed. He was killed. He paid the price. The warnings were real. He lost his life because he was Jesus' witness and Jesus' faithful one. He was killed. And evidently, the entire church knew his testimony. And Jesus is calling the church to remember him. Listen, if that were to happen in our midst, if that were to happen in our midst, there would be a varied effect. Some would be buoyed by that and say, this is what it means to follow Christ. And others would begin to say, I don't know if that's what I want to go through. I'm not sure that's where I want to be aligned. And Jesus says, no, I want your eyes on Antipas. I want your eyes on him. I want you to remember what you know to be true about him. We need to think through that pretty carefully. What are you going to take your stand over today that you're willing to lose your life over? Think about that carefully. This is not risking your life to oppose vaccination mandates or higher taxes or rights to assemble as you wish. Say what you believe. This is not that kind of thing. I think some of those issues are certainly worth taking stands over. But those kinds of issues are not inherently tied to faith in Jesus. You need to make sure that what you are going to take your stand over in front of the culture, that it's completely tied to what it means to be Jesus' faithful witness, so that when you suffer for it, you suffer for your loyalty to what Jesus himself died for. Not cultural ease, Not merely American rights, but something greater, more eternal, deeper, tied to the identity of Christ himself. Be most careful about what you want your life to be defined by, because it will be what you likely will then give your life for. And perhaps the Lord will provide us examples Examples perhaps in our congregation that we will personally see who will encourage us 
as to the value of loyalty to Jesus Christ. Certainly the Lord has used many biographies throughout the redemptive history and through the scriptures to show us this kind of thing. Daniel and his three friends in the face of cultural calls to mix their worship with that of the Babylonians and the Persians. Stephen in Acts chapter 7 boldly stood for the witness of Jesus as Lord in front of a Jewish crowd who stoned him when he pointed to Christ sitting at God's right hand. John the Baptist boldly confronted Herod for his immoralities and he lost his head for that. Paul embraced chains and eventual martyrdom for the chance to preach Jesus to Caesar. Jesus himself lost his life and refused to save himself from unlawful, unjust, public humiliation and criminal execution out of loyalty to his father's plan. Virtually every apostle was martyred for their witness. John himself is on the island of Patmos as he records this vision because he was a faithful witness for Jesus and Jesus alone. Read Fox's book of martyrs and see the series of portraits of ultimate loyalty to Christ. Read the journals of Jim Elliott and the story of his life, of how he loved the Alcas enough that he would give up his life so they could hear the witness of Christ. Most Christian biographies that you come across of memorable saints contain in it some kind of suffering and give you a picture of what holding fast to the witness of Christ looks like. And you might be one in your family who is maligned, and you are ostracized, or may, you may lose your job, or you may lose friendships because of your loyalty to Christ. And we need to rehearse them. Again and again, we tend to forget. When compromise starts to encroach and the pressure increases, what do you need to do? Remember. Think about the Antipas-like people in church history in your church, who are so faithful to Christ, they're willing to lose whatever is necessary. Keep the ultimate judge in mind. Remember the faithful in the midst of faithlessness. Two principles to keep you from compromise. Let's look at a third. There's a third principle for churches to pursue so they avoid the pitfall of cultural compromise. Number three. Beware of harmonizing Christianity with culture. Here's the meat of this letter. Beware of harmonizing Christianity with culture. Look at verse 14. But in contrast to the faithful loyalty you have among you, I have a few things against you. Because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Beware of harmonizing Christianity with culture. I have a few things against you. I never want to hear Jesus say that to our church. It's like he's building them up just for a moment. You have wonderful faithfulness. There's some who are so loyal. You even have Antipas who gave his life. But when Jesus says, but, your ears ought to perk up. If he said to your church, wonderful, I love what I'm seeing, but this is where you better pay attention. I have a few things against you. If the one who has the sharp sword coming from his mouth has something against you, if the one who's coming back to judge the nations has something against you, listen very, very carefully to this. You have some there who hold to the teachings of Balaam. Now, thankfully, this was not the whole church, but to be sure, the whole church will soon be tainted and be defined by what the some are doing if they're not careful. So what is the teaching of Balaam? Well, if you've studied the Bible some, you know this is from the Old Testament, isn't it? It's from the book of Numbers. 
Balak, the king of Moab, wanted to stop Israel from marching into Canaanite territory, and the Amorites were incapable of stopping them, so Balak came up with a plan. I want you to look with me at that just for a moment. We won't linger here long, but I want your eyes to see it. I want your eyes on this. Numbers chapter 22, just to get the picture so you understand what Jesus is referring to when he says, I've got some things against you. Numbers 22 is the account that begins Balak's plan to trip up Israel. Verse 1, then the sons of Israel journeyed and camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan opposite Jericho. Numbers 22. Verse 2, now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw that all that Israel had done to the Amorites. So Moab was in great fear because of the people, for they were numerous, and Moab was in dread of the sons of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this horde will lick up all that is around us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of Moab at that time. So he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, a people came out of Egypt, Behold, they cover the surface of the land, and they are living opposite me. Now, therefore, please come. Curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I may be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their hand, and they came to Balaam and repeated Balak's words to him. So this is a pagan way to try to rub the talisman of paganism and see if they can get God or the gods to bring a curse on Israel that would weaken them so much that the Moabites could defeat them. None of it worked. None of it worked. Because every time that Balaam wanted to open his mouth and pronounce a curse, what happened? He ended up blessing them. He ended up bringing the blessing of the Creator God, Yahweh, on all of Israel. And it frustrated Balak to no end. Look at Numbers chapter 25. Every time he tried to get a curse, he couldn't get it. And notice what happens after all of Balak's empty attempts to bring a divine curse on Israel. All of it was fruitless, but Numbers 25, verse 1. While Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. For they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor, and the Lord was angry against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you slay his men who have joined themselves to Baal of Peor. Then behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and all the sight of the congregation of the sons of Israel while they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of meeting. I want you to get the picture of this. He brought, this Israelite brought a Midianite woman to marry her in public in front of the Lord's temple while people are suffering execution for their syncretizing religion. This is not a small act. This is brazen. And verse 7 says, when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he arose from the midst of the congregation and took a spear in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and pierced both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through the body. So the plague of the sons of Israel was checked, and those who died by the plague were 24,000. You do understand what's going on here. Israel did not abandon Yahweh. They merely added to Yahweh's worship. They syncretized the worship of Yahweh with the worship of Baal of Peor. They wanted to keep one foot in faithfulness to God and another foot 
in loyalty to the gods of the land. And perhaps then they could achieve their goal of entering into the promised land and be successful. Let's make peace. Look like a way to get along with the people, to live in the land peacefully, get them where they wanted to go. What's so fascinating is that while Balak was trying to get Balaam to pronounce curses, Israel didn't know any of that, did they? They're down in the valley doing what they're doing. They have no idea of the curses that are trying to be pronounced on top top of them. But when they're introduced to the opportunity to syncretize and find another way to make peace with the people in the land, they easily bite into it. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Well, if you're in Numbers still, go over to Numbers 31 just for a moment and look at verse 16. In verse 16 of Numbers 31, Behold, these caused the sons of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, so the plague was among the congregation of the Lord. How fascinating is this? Balaam became a counselor who encouraged Balak not to curse Israel, but to get Israel to compromise. So if you go back to the passage in Revelation, in Revelation 2, You go back there and notice you have some who kept teaching. They constantly taught the teaching of Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So it didn't work for the culture to rain down curses on God's people. What worked was to entice God's people with compromise. That's what worked. To keep on teaching, all the time teaching, that compromise is the way to success. He put a stumbling block in front of him. It's an interesting word. It's the word scandalon. The word scandalon, from which we get scandalous in English, is a word that doesn't mean just to trip over something, but it's a fatal fall. It's a fall from which you don't get back up. He's causing Balak and Balaam caused Israel to fall fatally. 24,000 executed in one day. The church in Pergamum are being tripped up to where some are likely leaving the faith altogether. And what's interesting is that the sacrificing of things to idols and immorality that goes along with it that we saw in Numbers. Idolatry and immorality are almost always tied together. Involving oneself with the gods of the pagan world typically involved a sexual encounter to get the favor of the gods to be brought upon you. That's what Israel was doing to appease the gods of the Moabites and adopt some of their pagan ways they had to have Immoral relationships, immoral relationships that God himself defined as immoral. The pagan world didn't think they were immoral. That was just a way to worship. It was just a way to get along. It was a way to bring the favor of the culture on them. So Israel was just doing what would bring them peace. And notice, there are some who hold the teaching of Balaam. I don't think that means that Balaam's name was somehow tied to this false teaching in Pergamum thousands of years later. I think it's very similar to what Balaam is doing. And what is that? It's compromise. And it likely is a part of what is referred to in verse 15 as the teaching of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were brought up in the church in Ephesus. Revelation two fifteen. here you have some holding to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Back in chapter 2, verse 6, Ephesus had the same teaching going on there. But there in Ephesus, they would not tolerate any false teaching. They would not tolerate syncretism. They just didn't love each other in the church. That was their issue. No false teaching. But Pergamum's very opposite. In the name of love, they would compromise. In the name of peace, in the name of success... Maybe you've seen that work in the church today, an attempt to be compatible with the culture. 
not, not be adversaries in terms of belief systems. Now listen, I'm all for being kind and gracious. We should be. Winsome, appropriately so. Not angry, not hateful. Not aggressive to the culture in an unnecessary way. But when it comes to belief systems, when it comes to what we believe about God and what it means to follow Him, there cannot be any compromise on that with the world system. But in the name of trying to be likable and similar and getting along and not rubbing the wrong way against the culture, maybe we take on a little bit of their system of belief. Maybe we say for evangelistic purposes, if we're likable, maybe we'll win them. Maybe it's the purpose of survival. We can't exist in this city if we maintain a distinctive, clear, Bible, Christian identity. They won't tolerate us here. So we we need to be less loyal. I, I see this happening in the church all the time. It starts to strike fundamentally at the sufficiency of Christ, what we'll say is, and you'll hear this all the time, ah, Jesus is good for the gospel to get you into salvation, but the rest of how you live your life, we need the mindset of the culture. He's good to get you into heaven, but in the name of common grace, all that the rest of the world teaches is what we need to imbibe in learning how to live. Maybe it's that we reject what Genesis says about the six days of creation because it doesn't fit with the secular evolutionary view. And we've got to find a way that makes us look intellectually credible. Or maybe we reject a a strict view of inerrancy, the inerrancy of the Scripture. And we say, well, the Bible was never really intended to be completely inerrant, and the Bible is infallible only in those areas where it addresses ultimate salvation, but not in all the practicalities. The Bible wasn't meant to prescribe how you should live. It's just meant as a general rule and a storyline of how to come to God. That typically breeds an acceptance of the culture's theories about lifestyle, which make us look more like the culture, live more like the culture, and relegates the details of the Bible to a place where they're basically unnecessary. And I I don't know, have you noticed, has it been clear to you, that when Scripture's details are relegated to the unnecessary, have you noticed that the culture's sexual ethic changes with that? So fascinating. Push the Bible's details to the margins of life and you begin to change the sexual ethic, secular biological views, societal leanings and pressure take over to change views of marriage, having children, sexuality, gender identity. And every church that synchronizes cultural philosophy with biblical teaching Every church, we saw it this week. Every church that synchronizes biblical teaching with cultural philosophies ends up changing their view on sexual ethics. Because who we are as human beings is tied to the beginning of creation and how we relate to and display God. And in the end, the church looks nothing like the Scripture and everything like the rest of society. And in the name of maintaining social acceptance and intellectual credibility with the culture, we compromise. We cripple our witness. You become less Christian and ultimately non-Christian, which is exactly what happened in the United Methodist Church this week. You've seen a rejection of the inerrancy of the Scripture and a rejection of the Scripture defining their identity, and finally they've abandoned a sexual ethic that the Bible describes. You see it over and over again. And that happens when Jesus isn't viewed as a judge. When he isn't viewed as the ultimate judge and you discredit as fanatical and over the top those extreme faithfulness, you're going to begin to harmonize Christianity with the culture. And the inevitable result is caving on Christianity and caving to being accepted by the culture every time. 
It's the teaching of Balaam. That's the teaching of the Nicolaitans. That's mainline Christianity as we know it today. Or any other attempt to mix culture as the best way to live, the most satisfying way to live. Don't harmonize. Let me look with you at a fourth principle. You'll have to listen fast on this, all right? A fourth principle in verse 16, to avoid cultural compromise. Consider Christ's coming judgment. So remember him as the judge, that's the first, but would you dwell for a moment on his coming judgment, verse 16? Therefore, repent. Repent. That is, stop syncretizing Christianity with the cultural philosophy. Stop syncretizing. Change your thinking in such a way that it reorients what you're doing with your life. Remember Numbers chapter 25. How did the plague stop in Israel? How did it stop? When Phinehas said, enough. I wonder if Antipas wasn't like a Phinehas in Pergamum. Where are our Phinehas people today who say, no more. This has to stop. And what if you don't repent? Repent. Or else I am coming to you quickly. And I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Now on this, let me just say, what does this mean I'm coming to you? I don't think this is a temporal kind of coming to judge this church in some temporary way. I think this is talking about eternal judgment. You say, on a church? Yes. This is talking about the return of Jesus. Remember, Revelation 19 is very clear. When Jesus comes and makes war, he comes with the sword of his mouth, right? This is a reference to that coming. And he's saying it to the ancient first century church in Pergamum. You say, how can that be? How can this church think about the ultimate coming of Christ against them? Well, listen, compromise eventually leads you to leave Christ altogether, Where are you going to be at the end of the day if you let compromise continue to to breed in your midst? You're going to become non-Christian. You will invite the judgment of God. You say, well, how is a church to think through that? Well, I don't have the time to walk through it, but I encourage you to go back to maybe this afternoon and meditate on 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 10, Paul talks to the Corinthian church And he says to them, he he addresses them and their leaders about how they're building the church. You remember that text? He says, if any man builds on the foundation of the church with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident because the day will show it. The day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. What's he telling the Corinthian church? You have leaders in your church who are building the church on what? Precious stones that when the fire comes, they withstand that fire because they're eternal materials. Or wood, hay, straw that when the fire comes are consumed by the day. And the day is a reference to the day of the Lord, the day of his judgment when he comes. Paul warns the Corinthian church, you have leaders building with eternal or non-eternal materials. How do you want to be built? Because the day when he comes back is going to show what your church is made of. You understand that. Redemption Hill, your ministry will be evaluated by the Lord when he comes. Whether this is eternal or this is somehow just a cultural kind of congregation, the day will show it. That's what Jesus is referring to, I am coming. In other words, we are to live as a congregation constantly, every single day, as if the events associated with the Lord's return could begin at any moment and expose who we are and what we're made of. Is this really a gospel-rich place? Or do we see ourselves caving? Do we hear the voices saying, don't be so tied to the details of the Bible. Be more broad about this. Keep your name Christian, but be broader. No, the Lord is coming. You keep his judgment in mind. 
That brings us to a fifth principle. This is a simple one. It's a hard one, but it's simple. The fifth principle in avoiding the pitfall of cultural compromise is to pay attention to Scripture. Where do I find that? First part of verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You see that refrain at the end of all of these letters, don't you? What does it say? What Jesus is saying to one church is what the Spirit is saying to all the churches, right? Every letter that Jesus writes, at the end of that letter, this is what the Spirit is saying to every church. And notice, it's not many messages that the Spirit has. It's a singular message that the Spirit has. That's why you could take all seven letters, and they're essentially one message that the Spirit is giving to all the churches through all of the age of the church. So that's to us. And what is recorded here is the very revelation of Jesus Christ by the Spirit delivered to the churches perpetually for us to believe, which means this is simply another way to say the revelation of the Spirit is the Word of God, the Scriptures. This is another way to say to this church, are you paying attention to the revelation the Spirit brings to you in the Scriptures? You cannot get your eyes off of that. You must constantly keep your eyes in God's Word. What does He tell us to do as a church? How are we to respond to what happens next in our society? What does loyalty to Christ look like? You look in the Scriptures. You never listen to the voices of the surrounding culture. What does the Spirit say? And that's not some emotional, ethereal thing that you get in your quiet time. It's very practical. It's black and white. It's on the pages. We have the book. It's there. Redemption Hill, you have a wonderful testimony of being loyal to the Scripture. Never budge on that. Never budge on that. Be the one place in this city, if you're the only one, hopefully you'll breed others. But if no one else will, be the one place where people know, well, that's where those crazies believe the Bible. Pay attention. It's not one sermon that changes a church. It's the discipline of every week hearing God's word over and over and over that instructs us and helps us. Pay attention. All right, let's run like mad to the sixth and final point. Live now with a future satisfaction in view. Again, I won't have time to unpack all of this, but let me touch on it. Live now with future satisfaction in view. Live now with future satisfaction in view. It's the last part of verse 17. To him who overcomes... To him I'll give some of the hidden manna, and I'll give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone which no one knows but he who receives it. What is the hidden manna? Manna actually means, what is it? So when you're asking, what's manna? That's it. What is it? So if you're asking that question, you're asking the right question. What is it? Well, we know from the Bible it was a honey-like wafer that appeared each day for Israel when they were in the wilderness And they were headed for the land of promise, and it was God's means of providing for their needs until they entered the land of promise. It was a way to keep them dependent on the Lord, to live off of what He provided until the fullness of the provision was theirs. So every day they had to pray like we're supposed to pray every day. Give us this day our daily bread. We're supposed to live as if the Lord were so dependent on Him for each day's provision. That's how Israel was to live. And then Moses was told to take a jar of that and to take it and to place it before the Lord, likely in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the throne of God among His people and on the earth. And you should put it there because this is how God would feed His people. It's fascinating that Jesus in John chapter 6 made mention of this manna, didn't He? And He said, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness... As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. John 6, 32, Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. 
And they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. We want that bread. So if manna was just a sign of dependence, then give us the kind that will lead us to eternal life. And Jesus said to them, what did he say? I am the bread. I am the bread of life. Why was that manna hidden in the jar in the presence of the Lord in front of the ark as a symbol for them to realize when the true bread of life came, he was the one who brings you into the Father's presence. He is true satisfaction in life. He's what will satisfy. You don't live Christianity by equalizing secular ideas with scriptural ones because it won't satisfy you. Christ himself is your only satisfaction. He is the hidden manna. But also, the text says, not only will I give you some of the hidden manna, which Jesus is essentially saying is myself, I will give him a white stone and a new name written on it. It's difficult to know exactly what this is referring to. Again, let me just quote New Testament scholar Robert Thomas. He suggests this. The free doles of bread and free admission to the entertainments that the people of the Roman Empire received from time to time were exchanged for tickets, which often took the form of white stones. Such a white stone with one's name on it was the basis for admission to special events. It was also a well-established custom to reward victors at the games with such a token enabling them to gain admission to a special feast. And the hidden manna, the other part of the reward in verse 17, suggests a reference to the messianic feast. The white stone is then a personalized stone which would serve as his token of admission to the great future feast with the Messiah. The new name is likely a name connected to our identity as God's people in eternity. You might ask, well, I wonder what my name will be. I don't know. You've got to get to eternity first and figure that out. But whatever your name will be, it will be a name that reflects your identity connected to Christ for eternity. The white stone perhaps is the entrance into that feast where Christ is the bread of life for eternity. What does that mean? To overcome is to reject dumbing down of Christianity, syncretizing Christianity, overcome that, remain pure, remain focused, remain resilient, remain loyal, no matter what. And what do you get for that? Eternal satisfaction with Christ on a new heaven and a new earth. You're willing to trade a few moments of cultural acceptance for eternity of satisfaction with Christ? Which, by the way, if that is your heart and you think, well, I don't see that it's too big of a deal to kind of trade off a little loyalty here and I don't have to completely give up Jesus and I can bring some of this in, you, you do understand where that leads. It may be the very sign that Christ is not all sufficient to you. Do you really believe? I think that's what he's drawing out here to this church. Do you really believe? Is eternity what means most to you? Is Christ who is most valuable to you? If not, the call is repent. Now, whether that's a repentance within faith or under faith, I don't know. I'm not sure it really matters. But if you feel yourself sliding towards compromise as a congregation, repent. If you feel yourself as an individual giving yourself more and more and more over to what the culture wants because it's easier and you don't have to lose so much over it, repent. Find Christ and eternity with Christ more satisfying now. Live now for eternal satisfaction. Doesn't mean you're going to have all sour life now. Not at all. He provides you an abundant life. Listen, when you know the end and that you're going to be the victor at the end, you live differently in the present. You live very differently. It's what we call hope. It doesn't really matter what comes against you. We don't lose heart because we look at things from an eternal perspective. I want you to think through that. Listen, you're uniquely positioned as a church 
I'm not going to say Lawrence is the throne of Satan. <laughs> Though some in Missouri think that. <laughs> but you are in a very unique place, aren't you? With ideology swirling around you, and there is a pressure that perhaps you feel now, I think you're going to feel it in the most intense ways. There's an intolerance growing towards what we believe. Listen, you won't gain any success by compromising. You know what leads people to faith in Jesus Christ is a church that stands out, that sticks out from all the other groups in the culture because of their unique radical loyalty to the scriptures. Watch what the Holy Spirit does with his own word in pagan lives when they start seeing the emptiness and the disaster that comes through their approach to life. And they look at you and they see joyful, abiding, resilient hearts that love Christ and each other and know that there's something better ahead. You will never lack for the power of the gospel and the power of Christ. And what a unique opportunity you have. Resist the temptation to compromise culturally. It's worth it. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this time where we could take what is really a brief moment of our week and think carefully about you and your word. And would you use this to speak to our own hearts individually, to those who are in this room who are outside of Christ and have not become a disciple of Jesus and need to embrace the Savior? Would you show them that you are the bread of life, the true manna from heaven that will satisfy, that will usher us into the messianic era where we'll feast with you forever? Show them the delights of Christ and open their eyes to see the satisfaction that comes, especially in light of the slavery that sin emits over those who are under it. And Lord, we pray for all who are faithful in Christ here to remain so. Keep them. Help them to guard one another and protect each other and to exhort one another day after day, as long as it's called today, lest anyone be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Put in front of us the constant vision of your return as judge that pulls us away from compromise and put in front of us the constant vision of a feast with you forever that keeps us loyal and tied to you. Use this day as a day that will bear the kind of fruit in this congregation that will last forever. We thank you for this opportunity to be together in your word. We pray in the name of our only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.